Welcome to the Hockey Writers Sabre Scoop, a weekly show with our top Buffalo Sabres writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, our team covers everything that happens with the Sabres. So get a pen and paper and turn up the volume. You're about to get the Sabres Scoop. Welcome to Sabre Scoop, presented by the Hockey Riders, a once-a-week show covering all things Buffalo Sabres and NHL hockey. We thank you for joining us today, and to make sure you don't miss any future episodes, be sure to subscribe to and like the show on YouTube and catch the great hockey content on thehockeywriters.com. You can find us on Twitter at SabreScoopTHW and everything else at the Hockey Rider. And as always, make sure you head over to MorningSkate.io to sign up for our daily Morning Skate newsletter. Jordan is a contributor to it now, so you definitely want to check it out. Um, you know, don't miss the latest and weirdest hockey news every day. Jordan, we're a little over a week into the NHL season, and I could not be more excited. Let's kick off the show. Yeah, I don't know if anybody really could have predicted this, Brandon, headed into the season. There's so much constant negativity surrounding this organization. But the Buffalo Sabres are undefeated 3-0 and to start off this regular season. They've defeated the Arizona Coyotes. You know, they just defeated Vancouver um, a few days ago, which is pretty surprising. They actually have been dominating their performance as well. This isn't a case of just getting great goaltending because they actually are getting terrific goaltending by 40-year-old Craig Anderson. <laughs> but they're actually playing very well 5v5. Like, they're actually outplaying their opponent, which is the most surprising part. We'll see if it can sustain, but let Saber fans be happy here. You know, they haven't had much to be happy about the past decade. I've seen, I know that's kind of a growing discussion right now. Let them be happy at this moment because this is just pretty insane to be witnessing. So let's kind of break it down here. The Sabres are off to a 3-0 start to the season for just the fifth time in franchise history. That's crazy. The last time coming in the 08-09 season. Is that impressive or surprising to you, Brandon? That's, I think it's a little bit of both. It's impressively surprising in that I can't believe that in 51 years of existence, this is just the fifth time they've been off to a 3-0 and start. It's not like they haven't had really good competitive Stanley Cup contending teams before. We both know that they have. Um, I guess it's just one of those things, you know, it's, it's hard to win a lot of hockey games in a row. And I guess to go three and zero to the start of the season, five times franchise history. I'm sure they're not alone in that regard um, with, you know, so few amount of times doing that, but the fact that they did it this season is what I think is so surprising to a lot of people. So, you know, hopefully it's a sign of good things to come. I know that's an intriguing point you brought up there and I'm going to bring it up as I uh, pose my next question for you. Is this a result of the team being good or just having no expectations or even both in your opinion? Again, I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. Like, I, I don't know if that's an easy cop-out answer, but I, I really do think a lot of it is having absolutely no expectations. And I think the biggest part that people aren't talking enough about, in my opinion, is that Don Granado has instilled a completely new culture. I think it actually comes from the top down, too. Kevin Adams has done a fantastic job, um, in my opinion. And Don Granado, just the, everything he says and does, it's clear that the team is playing just more inspired. They're playing like they actually have some chemistry. Imagine that. They're playing like they are having fun out there. And the players themselves say it, even the older guys like Okpozo and Gergensens, who are having great starts of their seasons, by the way. Um, so I think it's like the team finally playing like a team, letting loose and just enjoying themselves out there. And I know it sounds cliche, but that's what they're saying. And it looks like it's paying off. No, I agree with you, Brandon. Like, I think John Granado is actually getting severely underrated, even even at the end of last season. Like, people haven't really been talking enough about this guy and what he's instilled into this team and how he's just made every player on the ice look better. You know, Rasmus Dallin was the big talking point at the end of last season, how much better he's looked. But yeah, this fourth line for Buffalo has just been incredible. Mm -hmm. Like, Zemkis Gergensen's might be going to the All-Star game this year again for a second time, the way he's been playing, currently leading the team in points. You know, so I don't know if this can really sustain but uh this is an interesting question i can pose for you here breaking that down that potentially because do we see this being similar to the 2018-19 season when the team went on that infamous 10 game <laughs> winning streak they were first in the nhl in november of that year they had a 17 6 and 2 record that's crazy to think about because they ended up collapsing and finishing 23rd that year they went from being first yeah. to 23 do we think something similar like that happens this year what what, what do you what do you project 
It's it's really tough to say because that was such a catastrophic collapse, right? And that was a team that's supposed to be competing. It was built to be a playoff team, at least with the personnel that they had and and where they were at that point, you know, in the franchise's existence. I mean, it seems like so long ago, but it really wasn't. Um, you know, the statistic is that teams that are in the playoff race by Thanksgiving typically make the playoffs to be first in the NHL and fall the 23rd catastrophic. This year, though, since the expectations are so, so low, um, I don't think they're going to come close to winning 10 games a row, even if they did. Um, I, don't, I don't think it would be as much of a disappointment if they fell and ended up missing the playoffs, um, just because that's what the expectations are. Now, Sabres fans could turn, you know, their frowns upside down and um, and start to believe in this team again if they really get on a roll but I'm not going to get uh, you know too ahead of myself here yeah, definitely you know especially with the team playing Boston tomorrow that's mm. going to be a huge like they're, they're obviously I mean Boston hasn't been off to a great start they're one and one obviously small sample size but this will be a true testament to see can they play great against the greater teams in the Atlantic division this will be a true test for this young group Totally. That segues into our next topic here, which is the injury bug, which is Sabres have been hit pretty hard by only through three games, which is really surprising. They've lost three players who were on the opening right night roster and skated in that first game. Um, so, so far in the 2021 to 22 season, despite playing in just three games, they've already lost Casey Middlestat, Henry Yoki Haru, and now Cody Eakin, who actually played pretty well on that aforementioned fourth line alongside Okpozo and Gergensen's, like we said. John Hayden's going to fill in for Eakin for a few games while he's gone. Specific to Hayden, what do we think of him getting his chance so early in the season? Do we see him becoming a staple in this lineup? Uh, it's definitely a possibility. Like you mentioned, like that uh, Gergensen's, Eakin's, uh, Akpozo fourth line has actually been their most productive line to start off this season. Now, obviously, that's not going to sustain over the long term, although I guess knock on wood, maybe it will. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you have to think it comes crashing down at some point. And if the history, you know, dictates itself. Cody Eakin was one of the worst players in the NHL last yeah. season. And I mean, we always said it like he was a guy that basically just won face-offs and that's it. So John Hayden's going to have a chance here to show if he can actually produce positive results next to Gergen and Pozo, he could potentially fight him uh, Eakin for that fourth line center spot. So I think this is a chance for a guy that could really be playing for his career here, trying to earn a regular position because it's right in front of him. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned crashing down to earth. So here, here's a question. I'm just going to put it out there. Do we think the Sabres are going to start crashing down to earth and losing some games here, given that they're losing some contributing players on their roster? I mean, I mentioned three players through three games and, and maybe it's just a bit of, you know, an easy going here in the early season. Maybe things start to get tough. What do you think? I mean, you kind of have to think so, but there's still some guys who haven't even necessarily contributed that much who I expect to pick it up a bit. Like, I think Dylan Cousins will score a goal soon here. I think Rasmus Dillon still has more to give offensively. And, I mean, you're just going to see more from lines one to three than necessarily the fourth line, you know. I think Victor Olofsson is even going to continue kind of his scoring pace that he's been able to do uh, since scoring that uh, power play goal in the first game. I think there's a lot that could happen here for this team still offensively. So like, I think it's like these games are going to be close. Like I don't think the Sabres are going to regularly get blown out by the looks of it. They're going to be in every game. And um, I think they're going to obviously not just win every game of the season. I don't really think they're going 82 and 0. Just like Montreal is probably not going 0 and 82, although it looks like they're going to be 0 and 5 to, uh, <laughs> tonight. But so maybe I should say that. But yeah, I would expect the Sabres to lose a few games here, but they're still going to look pretty decent in the games that they're ultimately lose, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So with that, you know, we're talking about guys that they could be losing. What about giving a guys uh, opportunities that aren't necessarily in the organization yet? Should the Buffalo Sabres claim Alex Bear Boulay on waivers? Seattle put him on waivers today. A little bit surprising considering they literally just claimed him off waivers from Tampa Bay last week. Uh, he even put, scored a goal for them, I saw. Like he's actually, he was decent, but they, I guess they didn't really give him an opportunity. And they don't think he can be a bottom six player for them. So. But here's the thing in Buffalo, Casey Middlestat's injured, you know, that could provide him with an excellent opportunity in a top six position. What do you think, Brandon? Should they claim Alex Bear Brule? Because it seems like they didn't do it last time. I know everybody was on the organization for not doing it last time. Should they do it this time? Yeah, I mean, last season, like you said, they were not willing to pick up players on waivers. Maybe it's because that was their MO last season. This season, though, it seems like they're not afraid. They just picked up defenseman Christian Wallenian, which we forgot to mention. Last week, it was actually after we recorded, that's why. But last week, they picked him up off waivers, um, and he's yet to play in a game for the Sabres, but 
that's already one waiver claim. Why not make it two? A lot of people are speculating Tampa's going to snatch him right back up, um, which, you know, that wouldn't surprise me as well for Alex Barboulet. Um, but yeah, I mean, what is the risk? It's very low here for the Sabres. I mean, God knows they're not up against the salary cap tightly by any means. Um, they could also use any help in the forward group as well. And for somebody who's looking for an audition, I mean, he had a point in a couple of games with Kraken. It's not like he can't play. So I think that would be a good low risk move for the Sabres. And if Kevin Adams wants to pull the trigger, I would be all in support of it. I agree. And just before we quickly touch upon another uh, potential guy, I think the NHL really needs to kind of clarify what the waiver order is moving forward here, because I always see so much confusion amongst even like people that hockey media, like they don't even know what the waiver order is. So I think that, uh, that needs to be more established so people understand who's the first team that can claim him, you know, what's the order, because I always see so much general confusion. I can never give a definitive answer to people who ask because it's like I couldn't even tell you because I've heard I've seen five different answers. So. NHL, that's someone you should fix. But, you know, there's still other opportunities here because they could go the waiver route. But what about if they look at Chicago Blackhawks center, Dylan Strom, who's currently become the 14th forward on this team. He's not even playing games, but, you know, he's still one of, he's a great offensive driver, you know. He still has put up decent seasons in the past. I know he hasn't lived up to his third overall pick, you know, roots, but. This guy put up over 50 points a few years ago. He can still drive to play decently. And for a team like Buffalo, I think he's actually pretty comparable to Casey Middlestead, in my opinion. And I think playing him under Don Granado, that's the type of guy that could thrive. The only problem is, what could the asking price be? And Brandon, if you were the Sabres, would you be willing to part away with the assets that Chicago potentially could be looking for? That's that's a loaded question. I mean, um, I will admit I'm not familiar with the exact asking price for Dylan Strom. Uh, there's um, people that believe that they want something along the lines of a top 20 prospect. I said I could even throw him mm, around today. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with you in comparing him to Casey Middlestad. Um, I mean, if there's, if there's anything that's been proven with Dylan Strom in his career thus far, it's that the initial change of scenery from Arizona to Chicago helped him immensely. Like you mentioned, his first season there, 50 plus points, and he was almost point per game there. The next season, a little bit of a dip. He was around 40 and then a significant dip from there on out. But I mean, maybe another change of scenery to, um, like you said, a coach like Granado, a system like the Sabres currently that they're playing right now, <clears throat> sorry, playing right now could be exactly what Strom needs. Um, so that would be really, really interesting. The Yeah, like you said, the big question is, would the Sabres be willing to give up what Chicago's asking? Because this is not a team that should be, trading young players and or picks right now um there might have to be something coming back the other way i'd be really intrigued to see if adams even enters the conversation uh that's something i would definitely follow and i wouldn't count the sabers out because strom is young enough that he could add to this core um so that's very intriguing i hadn't considered that yet yeah, definitely you know and i mean i wouldn't necessarily if they, if they could get them for like a second round pick and maybe they move a roster player up, maybe they could even get a third round pick something back. You know, maybe they're just letting Chicago move up. I would definitely explore that. Like I wouldn't be giving up a first round pick for a guy that can't even crack the lineup. I think Buffalo would actually be in the, a position of power in this situation because they would kind of control the leverage here because Chicago isn't even playing him. So they're not even valuing him as one of their top 12 forwards at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree there. And just a fun story to wrap up our Sabres talk here before we get into some general NHL news. Uh, Western New York native and ex-NHLer Ryan Callahan, who's now with ESPN Broadcasting, tweeted the following this week. My team growing up just down I-90, Buffalo Sabres are on fire right now. Can they keep it rolling Friday versus the NHL Bruins? John Buch sorry, this is in tweet form, so I'm trying to translate into English. At Buchagross and I will be calling the game on ESPN+. Plus. And Bucci responded and said, let's go, Buffalo Sabres fans. Fill the bar on Friday night for me and Callie on ESPN+. Plus. If it's a sellout, I'll buy everybody a beer. Bourbon for me, neat. Hashtag one Buffalo. So this got a lot of people in Sabres Twitter, in the Sabres Twitterverse, excited. And I just got to ask, is this love for the Sabres a direct result of their early season success? Would we, would we be seeing it otherwise? And with the dismal attendance this season so far, even though they're winning, does this prove that winning will get this team the respect they deserve again and get people back in the arena? Uh, definitely. I think it's a combination of the two, you know, like I think John Bucci Gross, who's 
one of the most, I mean, he's really uh, has a lot of followers, I believe. Like he's almost at the million follower range on Twitter. It attracts a lot of people here. And I mean, this is ESPN we're talking about, right? If I'm not mistaken, this is going to be the first ESPN broadcast of a Sabres game. So with Boston, obviously an original six team. So it's going to attract a lot of people regardless. You're going to be seeing Boston fans in Buffalo. And I mean, that's obviously an incentive. I'm curious to see. I think this is lining up to be the most uh, filled game at key bank center. Like I would be kind of shocked if they don't get the most fans here. I think they're breaking 10,000, maybe even more. So <laughs> I don't necessarily know if it's going to be a sellout. I mean, that'd be awesome. If it was a sellout, everybody got a beer. Cause it, uh, I mean, people were tracking out what that would actually add to if it was a sellout, that would be like $200,000 or something <laughs> like that. So I'd be, I mean, I'd be curious to see if that happened, but uh, yeah, I'm curious to get your take there, Brandon. Yeah. I think that. Something like this could definitely get more people in seats. I mean, there's a lot of contributing factors, right? Like you said, an original six team, it's the Boston Bruins. It's their premiere on ESPN for the Sabres, at least. Um, you know, it's a Friday night. There's a lot going into it now that they're hot that they can probably get more butts back in the seats. But something like that, you know, just offering to buy everyone a beer, even if I'm not sure he's 100% serious about it. I don't know what kind of money Buchagross has. But, um, you know, it's really fun and that you need that sort of interaction. So I, I was really excited when I saw that, you know, Buffalo getting some love from the ESPN crew. Um, yeah, I think it's good all around and hopefully they keep winning because I think they'll get the same attention, which is just great to see. <clears throat> and with that being said, let's reset the show here. You're watching Saber Scoop presented by the Hockey Riders. Make sure to subscribe to and like the show on YouTube and catch the great hockey content on the hockeywriters.com and on our Twitter feed at SaberScoopTHW. Jordan, we're hopping into some general news here. Like I said, we're a little over a week into the new NHL season. I've enjoyed watching the games. There's been a good amount of surprising storylines so far. And I know we're only about three or four games into things here for most teams, but there are still five teams, which I think is a pretty big amount, that have yet to win a hockey game. The Jets, the Canadians, as we said, who are about to be 0-5, it looks like. The Coyotes, the Blackhawks, and the Flames. Did we expect such poor performances right out of the gate for any of these teams? Are any of them underperforming? Let's kind of break this down, you know, like looking at Arizona, we all thought Arizona was going to be a bad team. You know, I was going on podcasts uh, in the THW podcast network, Howlers and Growlers, and we were literally having a conversation on which team, which one of our teams is going to be worse. <laughs> so I'm not surprised Arizona is doing that bad. The other ones, though, are pretty shocking, like the Chicago Blackhawks, you know, mm. they went all in this summer. They got Mark andre Fleury for basically nothing from Vegas. They traded all of those assets for Seth Jones. And guess what? Cole Sillinger on Columbus just scored his first NHL goal. So, uh, I mean, Columbus is uh, laughing at that deal at the moment because Seth Jones has not looked good with the Chicago mm -hmm. Blackhawks as the whole team has it. The Montreal Canadiens are obviously the biggest storyline, right? Like, I mean, people obviously saw some sort of downfall coming. And what people obviously always forget in this conversation, yes, they made it to the Stanley Cup Finals last year. They were the 16th ranked team. They barely even made it. Like, they were literally just a few points away from missing the postseason. This is a team that struggles to even get into the playoffs. They can do damage if they're there, but they got to make it. So if you lose Shea Weber, you know, who projects not to play again, if you lose Carey Price, you lose Tomas Tatar and Philip Dedeau in free agency, it's going to be a tough time there. So obviously, I mean, in my eyes, Montreal's the biggest one. I'm curious to get your take there. Do you think Montreal's the biggest team out of this group that's just been like, wow, how are they this bad so far? I think they're the biggest disappointment so far, but uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. I really think that when Carey Price comes back, they're going to play a lot better than they have been playing. Goaltending is obviously not the biggest issue. If you can't score goals, um, you're going to have a really tough time in this league, and they can't score goals right now. I mean, Christian Dvorak has one point with the team so far, and he's really got to step things up. I mean, he was sort of the prize for letting Kokanemi walk. Um, so they're probably the biggest disappointment for me. The biggest surprise would be the Winnipeg Jets. I know just like Montreal, a lot of people predicted sort of a downturn for this team, but I didn't think it was going to be such an acute downturn. I mean, they, they still have a lot of great players, except Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler, I believe now are out on COVID protocol, yeah. which is a huge hit to the team. Um, but I still think there's a good hockey team and hopefully when they come back, they can prove that it's just their division is so tough. So I, I, I really don't know, but um, the Blackhawks, they're interesting as well. And I guess I'll just be fair, include every team, throw in the Flames too. I'm not sure what to think about the Flames ever this season, this season especially. I agree there. Like they're at least winning against Detroit tonight to nothing the last I checked. So, I mean, that's a positive for them. But the Calgary Flames have always been this team the past few years where they're like, 
uh, you know, they're not really necessarily a Stanley Cup contender. You know, I know they went out and got Chris Tanev and Jacob Markstrom a couple off seasons ago, thinking that they could really propel this group. They even just got Blake Coleman in the off season. He even scored a few nights ago. I saw, and I mean, he's been decent, but like, this isn't a group I think that's going to win the cup. But it's, they're obviously not going to be bad enough where they're going to need to rebuild, right? And this is the season where Johnny Gaudreau needs to be re-signed. So this is obviously huge. Like, is, are they going to keep this core intact? There's all of these Matthew Kachuk rumors. They need to figure out what's going on in Calgary because right now, you know, it doesn't really seem like they have a, a long-term plan here. So obviously, I mean, it seems like that tend to go downhill pretty quickly. But looking at all of these surprising teams, we're going to ignore Buffalo because we just spent quite a bit of time <laughs> talking about them. The division leaders at this moment across all four divisions are currently the Florida Panthers, the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Edmonton Oilers, and the St. Louis Blues. I want to break down the St. Louis Blues first with here with you, because if you actually do look at all four of their forward lines, they're actually pretty stacked in that position. And a guy like Jordan Cairo has completely broken out this season. He's looked incredible. I think he might even put up a point per game, if I'm being honest, because he's always drove the play. It's kind of been one of those underrated guys. And I think this is the year where the puck's going to start going into net for him. What do you think about St. Louis so far? St. Louis really impressed me, especially because I was pretty tough on them last season. They were underwhelming to say the least last season barely squeaked in the playoffs and then did not impress very much at all there with the first round early first round exit um i thought that because of the way that their division was stacked up like i mentioned the central is just so tough i didn't think they were going to be near the top and obviously we're only three or four games into the season but they look like a good team they look like that stanley cup pedigree team i mean if jordan binnington can play like he did in his rookie season if they're all four forward lines can roll like they always do. I mean, they've always built been built that way. They've never really been top heavy with that star talent. They've sort of had four really solid lines with some pretty good players, and that's how they win games. Um, you know, especially if teams like the Jets are going to falter, if Minnesota is going to falter at any point, the Blues can really take advantage of that. So they're a big surprise to me. Um, the other three really aren't surprising other than – you know, the Penguins just being infuriating. So you don't um, think Vegas over Edmonton at the moment is surprising? I, my top two were Vegas and in Edmonton. And I probably had Vegas ahead of Edmonton, but just because of the players, Vegas is, you know, they're, they're missing right now, like Pacioretty and Stone. Um, that That's probably the reason I'm sense. not so surprised, but um, Vegas fully healthy. If they finish behind Edmonton, I will be surprised. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Drysaddle and McDavid. McDavid just had his 10th career hat trick. Um, that's crazy to think about, you know. Um, but yeah, the Penguins, with all the players that they're missing and still playing well, I mean, that's such a Pittsburgh thing to do. Oh, yeah. I know. Uh, like Pittsburgh going into Toronto on Saturday is missing all of these players. So we're going <laughs> to see which next random AHL of they insert into the lineup that becomes the next Brian Rust and just, you know, tears it up next to Crosby because, you know, that's going to happen soon. The Florida Panthers, too, are the interesting team there because obviously, I mean, they got Sam Reinhardt in the offseason. They've added Anton Lundell, who's really worked well there. I'm just curious what you think. Do you think this is a team that should be expected to be a top two team in the division? Like, should teams really not be underrating them? Like, should we be really focusing on this Florida Panthers team as a team that could really win the Stanley Cup? 100%, in my opinion. I, I've been sold on this team since they – pretty much since they made the Reinhardt trade. And I looked at that forward group – and I was like, wow, this is going to be really dangerous. And lo and behold, I mean, Sam Bennett's been on fire. Sam Reinhardt's been on fire. Like you said, Anton Lindell, as a young player, taking a huge step forward, a player the Sabres could have had, um, taking that huge step forward. Um, and and I like I said, the key, in my opinion, is going to be the goaltending. If the goaltending can hold up, um, people are saying there might be a controversy between Bobrovsky and Knight. I believe one of our Panthers writers actually wrote that article recently, breaking that down. So go read that, THW fans. Um, but yeah, if that goaltending can stay solid, then this team is a Stanley Cup contender. That, I mean, that's my only concern. Otherwise, they're they're great and really interchangeable with Tampa Bay in my mind. Definitely. And heading into game action here, you know, we're talking about games that happened on Thursday night. Yasperi Kotkaniemi returning to the Bell Center in Montreal for the first time in a Carolina Hurricanes jersey. Since signing that offer sheet, you know, for $6.1 million over the summer, that $20 signing bonus included. We all remember how crazy of a Sega that was. And he was greeted by Habs fans in quite a harsh manner, <laughs> being met with the chance of 6.1 and F-U-K-K. 
Do we think Kotkaniemi deserved this kind of treatment from his old team's fans? And who is looking like the early winner of this momentous decision from the summer? Montreal or KK? I'll answer the second question first and say that Jesperi Kotkaniemi is looking like the early winner. I mean, he's on what clearly looks like the better team right now. I mean, the Hurricanes had a disappointing playoff exit last season, but I still would put them up there in the conversation of teams that can go on a deep run again. Um, and, and just adding him into that lineup, I think he's probably personally feels like he's in a much better situation right now. He was never truly embraced. It's probably because of where he was drafted. I mean, people knew from the start, he was drafted much too high, or at least many people thought that in the draft. Um, and then he was never going to get paid that kind of money in Montreal. It just wasn't what they thought he was worth. And he never lived up to that third overall selection. I, I think he's the clear early winner here. I, you know, I'm going to say I don't think he deserved that kind of treatment, but I'm also not a Montreal Canadiens fan. I also don't have those emotions flowing through my blood. So I, I don't know if I can give an impartial answer, but I really don't think he deserved that kind of treatment. But what do we expect? People are, you know, passionate, if that's the right word. Yeah, definitely. What I would say to those fans was, would you take what's three times worth your value if that was offered in your job? I'm assuming so, right? But <laughs> obviously, fandom's one thing. You know, you see one of your players leave your team. It's going to happen. And in a, Mont- in a market like Montreal, it was destined to happen. Like, if it happens in any of those original six markets, you're just going to get booed no matter what, you know? And it kind of leads perfectly into our next little question here, because on a similar note, Linus Allmark will be guarding the net as a member of the Boston Bruins this time when they play at Key Bank Center in Buffalo tomorrow night, which is Friday. Do we expect this same kind of welcoming for Allmark, who willingly signed as a free agent contract with another team this summer? Do we expect the same sort of thing to happen as KK with tonight in Montreal? Or do you think Buffalo Sabres fans will be a little bit more welcoming? Oh, that's tough, too. I've been thinking about this one. I can't really put my feelings together about Olmark going to Boston. So I can only imagine what the people who are going to the games are going to feel like. Um, I don't know. I understand his decision to leave Buffalo and to go play for Boston. I mean, when, when that kind of opportunity presents itself and for him to get paid pretty handsomely for a goaltender on a four-year deal, I think, I think he did the right thing for himself personally. But if I were, in that building as a fan, I, I wouldn't blame the fans if they started, you know, taunting him a little bit, chanting his name while he's in the goal. I'm not sure if I'll hear any, you know, profanity um, like the Montreal gave to Jesperi Kock and Yemi, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I'm interested to hear what you think. Honestly, I don't know. Like, I'm curious to see if they're going to do any sort of video replay before the game, yeah. you know, welcoming him. I know we haven't really heard of that yet, but if they do, you know, I don't think I don't think he's the type of guy that's going to really get booed. You know, like I think people can understand why he would sign with Boston. You know, I don't think there's necessarily hard t- feelings there, but maybe I'm completely off base. I have no <laughs> idea. So, I mean, I would be surprised, though, if, I, if going off the question, I would be kind of surprised if Linus Allmark actually got booze in Buffalo on Friday night. Maybe if he gets a shutout and he just clearly is stopping every puck, the Sabres are firing and maybe you'll start to hear some booze there because people will be upset he's not with this team. But I'll be kind of surprised if he really receives any sort of booze at the beginning of the game. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I think a video tribute would be fitting. I mean, there were some real awesome saves that he made as a saber and he really played very, you know, quite well, honestly, for being on pretty what was the worst team in the league for a few seasons. Um, But, you know, there weren't many great moments you know, when he was a member of the Sabres as far as the team's overall performance. So I I guess it's sort of up in the air, but I am interested to see. I'll be watching to see if anything happens. Um, Any parting words for our Sabres scoop fans as we sign off here? Yeah, this is obviously a great start to the season. You know, Owen Powers tearing it up in Michigan. So seeing a team go on this type of start, knowing you have a first overall pick in your back pocket, the, uh, back pocket, sorry, and Owen Powers is going to be inserted into the lineup, potentially even at the end of this season. Who knows? He could sign his entry level if Michigan ends up winning. There could be a little time there. I think we're actually going to have a pretty nice season here in Buffalo. I don't think it's going to be as negative as years past. You have to hope. And I think this is going to honestly be a good year for Sabres fans because you know there's a plan moving forward. And I mean, even looking at the front office ads they just made, they just added somebody else to their analytical staffs and they now currently have four members. A Galamite Jr., the manager of research uh, over at uh, um, 
at the I forget the website at the moment, but the hockey analytics website. They've really added a lot to the team here. So I, I like the direction that they're currently going. It's stat leads. Sorry. There we go. It gives us in mm. my name there. But yeah, I really like how the team's looking forward here. And uh, I think fans should be happy. I certainly hope so. And I agree myself. We thank you for joining us. This has been Saber Scoop presented by the Hockey Riders. Make sure to subscribe to our show on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Saber Scoop THW. And once again, make sure you head over to morningskate.io to sign up for our daily Morning Skate newsletter so you don't miss the latest and weirdest hockey news every day. Don't miss out on all of the great hockey content on thehockeywriters.com. For Jordan, this is Brandon, and this has been Saber Scoop. Until next time.